Imagine one day you woke up to find your phone was dead, your bank account was empty, and when you turned on the faucet, nothing came out. You can't go to a neighbor for help because they're all in the same situation. You have no idea how it happened or even how you could figure that out. Don't start freaking out just yet, but this reality could be a lot closer than you might think. Wars have been fought with sticks and stones, to swords, to cannons, to laser-guided missiles. Now as we venture into the adolescence of the information age, the battlefields of the world may look very different as a new type of warfare takes over. This is everything you need to know about cyber warfare. Most of you have probably encountered some level of hacking in your life. Hopefully it wasn't too malicious. Maybe you got a strange message from your aunt on Facebook and had to awkwardly tell her that her account was compromised. God forbid, maybe you know someone who had their bank account information or their home title stolen. These are all things we need to be aware of and take precautions for in the modern world. Don't share your personal information publicly and make sure you've got a strong password. But as damaging as this kind of attack can be on a personal level, imagine if it was scaled up. Remember the 2016 presidential election? The media talked about hacking non-stop. Many wondered if a foreign power broke into the Democratic National Committee and stole thousands of emails. This is the second high-profile hack of a Democratic political organization in just the last week. The DNC email hack. The investigation into the hacks of the DNC. Some thought Russia or China were responsible. Or, as Donald Trump suggested, it also could be someone on their bed that weighs 400 pounds. I mean, it could be Russia, but it could also be China. It could also be lots of other people. It also could be somebody sitting on their bed that weighs 400 pounds, okay? Okay, so what exactly is hacking? Well, it's any attempt to get into phones, computers, networks, and other systems. This can happen for lots of reasons. Maybe the hackers want financial gain, infamy, or just the thrill of breaking into someone else's computer. There's also lots of different ways to do it. In a DDoS attack, a hacker floods a network with traffic, overwhelming it and shutting it down. You could download a virus that slows down your system or destroys data. There's also ransomware, which gets into a system and locks it up until the user forks over payment. So hacking on a large scale can influence politics and compromise vital information. But what about the hacking of a critical piece of infrastructure that people depend on to survive? In May of this year, the Biden administration reeled after a massive ransomware attack shut down the Colonial Oil Pipeline which caused gas shortages in states like Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. The company's co-CEO had no choice but to give $4.4 million in Bitcoin to the hackers. The colonial attack was definitely one of the biggest cyber attacks in recent memory, and millions of Americans felt the impact. Long lines at gas stations and higher prices were annoying, but what would happen if the gas ran out completely for weeks or even months on end? What if the same kind of attack hit the water supply or the electric grid? That possibility worries the leadership of other critical infrastructure networks. Wall Street executives told Congress during a hearing that cybersecurity is the biggest threat to the financial system, especially in light of the growing willingness of nation states to attack civilian infrastructure. Greg Rattry, the former director of cybersecurity at the National Security Council, said that the financial system would most likely withstand an attack on one institution. But there's a real risk of the markets shutting down for weeks if multiple institutions were affected. That means no more credit cards, no more bank withdrawals, and no idea of when they'll all be back. Lawmakers voiced similar concerns during a hearing about security gaps in the water sector. Senator Angus King of Maine even said that a cyber attack would probably be the next Pearl Harbor or 9-11. I believe, Mr. President, the next Pearl Harbor will be cyber. That's going to be the attack that attempts to bring this country to its knees. And as we've learned in the pandemic, we have vulnerability. And that the loss of water supply in such a scenario would be an incipient nightmare. The colonial attack confirmed to the military what it already knew, that civilian defenses were lackluster. Military defenses, though, are another story. Retired Army General Martin Dempsey said this as far back as 2015, and he also said that cyber defense was one of his top priorities. The Department of Justice had actually just prepared to follow up with a sort of attack waged against Colonial. It managed to locate the ransom payment and seize $2.3 million using a task force created just a few months earlier. The group was put together to take a whole of government approach to hacking, promising to do takedowns of servers used to spread ransomware and seizures of these criminal enterprises' ill-gotten gains. Apparently, security of critical government systems is being taken much more seriously these days, since a 2013 report found that, for over 20 years, the launch codes for the United States Minuteman nuclear missiles were 00000000. Seriously, 
Hopefully these new efforts will build up the trust of the public. Iran hacks into the control system of an American dam just 20 miles north of New York City. The DOJ task force is only the beginning of the US government's attempt to fight cybercrimes. In 2010, the Defense Department launched the United States Cyber Command, sometimes called Cybercom. Under President Trump, the agency was elevated to the status of a unified combatant command, giving it a broad and continuing mission to protect American cyberspace. And it's not just for defensive means. Cyber Command is ramping up its retaliatory missions. Politicians from both sides of the aisle have been calling for this for quite a while. During the 2016 campaign, Trump said that the United States must possess the unquestioned capacity to launch crippling cyber counterattacks. Four years later, Biden took a similar position in the months after his election, affirming that a good defense isn't enough. We need to disrupt and deter our adversaries from undertaking significant cyber attacks in the first place. In 2019, as tensions worsened in the Middle East, Iran shot down an American drone. There were multiple retaliatory measures on the table. Then President Trump decided against a missile strike over concerns of civilian casualties. Instead, he told Cyber Command to take down a known Iranian digital spy network that had been harassing commercial ships in the region for years. For at least a few months, the US attack wiped out a database used by the spies to plot against commercial vessels passing through their region. It also took military communication networks offline. We can definitely expect these kinds of forward deployments to continue. More than likely though, the public will never know they happened. Chair of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, confirmed to Congress in July that cyber is a top priority of his, as well as an area of US vulnerability. He told lawmakers that the military can and should hit foreign bad actors at the source of mischief. President Biden even wants to toss $10.4 billion into the next defense budget for cybersecurity, $2.4 billion of which will increase cyber capacities for the uniform branches. The United States has always worked with its strong allies, and Cyber Command is no different. The US and Australia developed and now practice together on a virtual cyber training range, which will evolve as new types of digital threats crop up. The US and France recently practiced a joint operation called Cyber Fort 3 to practice taking down advanced persistent threats. We're not the only ones moving though. Hostile nation states are quickly getting bold with their digital powers. China routinely targets America's top companies, like when they hacked Microsoft and its exchange email service, compromising data from law firms, government services, healthcare providers, and even family businesses. And in probably one of the worst attacks so far, Russians got into the software SolarWinds, breaking into the laptops of 27 US attorneys who handle the nation's top cases. Agents could even expose secret informants' identities, possibly blowing their cover. That hack was no doubt on President Biden's mind when he urged Vladimir Putin to abstain from targeting key US infrastructure by cyber attack in the event of conflict. Biden's strategy apparently was to invoke the honor system. We can only hope the Russians abide by it. What would this kind of attack on our infrastructure look like? Take the transportation system, for instance. Imagine hackers were able to disrupt communications between air traffic controllers, possibly even feeding them false data. All flights in the US could be grounded for weeks. Think about that for a minute. It's not just people heading on vacation that use flights. Business commuters, US mail, Amazon, vital imports, all of that would stop too. If that's not enough, imagine if the hackers were able to take out the power grid. Not only are flights grounded, but now you can't charge your phone. All the food in your fridge rots, gas pumps shut down, water treatment plants stop, and maybe scariest of all, no one is coming to help. Eventually, hospitals go dark while ambulances and police have no way to communicate or discern who needs help. How many people today rely on their phones for work, food, supplies, and basic social interaction? How fast would everything fall apart if it were taken away? According to a US task force on national and homeland security, China has spent years developing weapons that could make all of this doomsday speculation a reality. Perhaps a more direct assault than subverting computer systems, China has been developing new capabilities of initiating and defending against EMP attacks. EMP, or electromagnetic pulse attacks, could disable not only the power grid, but also fry anything with a computer chip, which is just about everything, by the way. Such an attack could take multiple forms. One that China has been developing specifically is the high altitude detonation of a specialized nuclear warhead. If they were able to pull it off, phones, cars, computers, airplanes, hospitals, everything would be irreparably disabled. In a report to Congress, Peter Pry, former chief of staff at the US EMP Commission, said that such an attack could lead to the death within a year of up to 90% of all Americans. You know, if we are not prepared to defend our electric grid now and put in place the measures, and if they were to strike us now when we are unprotected, millions of Americans would die. 
Governments of the Cold War era developed incredible weapons of war that threatened entire cities with instant destruction. Not to be outdone, it seems we may have made something even worse. Not weapons that level cities, but rather collapse every shred of civilization, leaving the survivors to fend for themselves in the aftermath. Now, Cyber Command wants to go beyond militaries and spy organizations. They want to hack the hackers who mount attack from US soil. National Security Agency Director General Paul Nakasone told Congress that domestic internet activity is a massive blind spot for American officials. The NSA only has authority to monitor foreign internet activity, thanks to the Fourth Amendment. Nakasone explained that foreigners can come into the United States, quickly gain access to an internet provider, and inflict their damage before they ever get hit with a warrant. Cyber Command General Counsel Kurt Sanger likewise argued that although the US tries to avoid using the military within its own borders, these limits don't have to stay in place for a cyber warfare group, especially since hacking that occurs on US soil is rarely carried out by Americans alone. Most Americans can probably remember how upset people got when Senator Tom Cotton said we should send in the troops to protect cities from BLM riots. And I said simply last Monday that if the local police are overwhelmed by the numbers of these insurrectionists, if they need support from the National Guard, or if necessary as a last resort, federal troops under the Insurrection Act, and that's exactly what has to happen. But would people be as upset if they couldn't see the forces that were deployed? Should they be? Instead of reserving Cyber Command to fight only the nation's greatest threats, like we do with the military, Sanger wants to see these self-imposed rules cast away for cybersecurity, which, in his words, is national security. Sanger said it took a decade to take out Osama bin Laden because he was always changing his location. But a cyber bin Laden could throw law enforcement off just by changing his clothes and going to sleep an hour earlier. Cyber Command, he said, needs to move just as fast. With domestic cyber warfare, there's a balancing act here between freedom and security. Whether foreigners are involved or not, we can't be certain of what exactly the future of warfare will look like. What we can be pretty sure of, though, is that the biggest cyber attack is yet to happen. Let's hope we're prepared.